Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Conversations on Anares. I'm Dr. Joseph Orozco. I'm a professor of philosophy at Oregon State University, and I'm the co-director of the Anares Project for Alternative Futures. Here on this program, Conversations on Anares, we talk with scholars, activists, and artists about the possibilities of radical social transformation today. In this episode, we sat down with Chris Dixon. Chris Dixon is a longtime anarchist writer and organizer with a PhD from the University of California at Santa Cruz. He's a member of the Punch Up Collective, a columnist for Canadian Dimension, and he's on the advisory board for Upping the Ante, an activist journal. He's a former board member of the Institute for Anarchist Studies. And in 2014, he published Another Politics, Talking Across Today's Transformative Movements which examined the eruption of anti-authoritarian political tendencies amongst a whole variety of social movements in the last 25 years in North America. We wanted to talk to Chris about the idea of the ecology of social movements, which is this metaphor that's being used to describe the ways in which social movements can be thought of as incubators of all sorts of different political experiments, all trying to achieve social transformation through a variety of different tactics and strategies. We also wanted to talk to Chris about some of his recent reflections on the importance of intergenerational organizing and the need to find ways to negotiate sectarianism amongst the left. Now, joining me in this special conversation were some really good comrades. First, my Inari's project co-director, Tony Vogt, who's a longtime friend of Chris's, and he's a scholar of social movements in his own right, as well as a prominent community and labor organizer here in Oregon. We were also joined by Alex Riccio, who is a labor organizer in Philadelphia, and he's the creator and host of the podcast Labor Wave Radio. While he was a student at Oregon State, Alex helped to create a, co a student collective that was called Allied St Students for Another Politics that was partly inspired by Chris's book. ASAP, as it was known, agitated for student concerns around issues like tuition and student debt. ASAP's most notable work, perhaps, was a direct action that shut down a meeting of the OSU Board of Trustees when the board failed to put a hold on yearly raises of tuition. So let's turn now to our discussion with Alex, Tony, and Chris about the ecology of social movements. All right, welcome everyone. We're here now with uh, Chris Dixon, and I'm joined with uh, some co-hosts today. Uh, first uh, and foremost, I want to acknowledge my co-director for the Inari's Project for Alternative Futures, Tony Vogt. Hey, Tony, how you doing? And uh, someone who's been with us before on uh, some other episodes, but I want to acknowledge Alex Riccio, who is a, uh, a longtime labor organizer and uh, activist that uh, we have gotten to know uh, at OSU and is now far, far away from us, been continuing his good work. So Alex, nice to see you again. Yeah. Glad to join. So Chris, uh, thank you for being here with us today to talk about your work and to help us understand a little bit about social movement dynamics, at least in the North American context that we're uh, gonna be discussing today. Um, we, uh, you know, we appreciate your time, but we appreciate your analysis uh, as well and your commitment that you've had for many, many years. You are uh, uh, known as being a movement scholar, uh, close to what, seven years ago, you uh, published uh, Another Politics, which was an analysis of anti-authoritarian trends going on in North American uh, leftist politics. And particularly what was, uh, what was interesting about that work was the way in which you uh, uncovered or revealed various kinds of anarchist tendencies that were going on uh, in a lot of social movement politics at that time, right? So the book came out in 2014. So one of the things that, uh, you know, one of the reasons that we asked Alex to, to join us in the conversation today was that uh, your book was very formative in helping to uh, create some fervor on the Oregon State campus uh, and inspiration in terms of uh, uh, student and campus organizing. And Alex was someone that was uh, behind uh, a lot of that. And um, we wanted to sort of talk about, you know, sort of get a, a kind of a, a testimony of how uh, your work at that time 
uh, inspired organizing, and then to see what you think about trends that are going on nowadays. So um, I wanted to turn this over to Alex a little bit to talk about, um, you know, if you could help us to understand a little bit about how you got to know Chris's work and what it meant for you at the time and what did you do with it? Yeah, so good seeing you again, Chris. And this moment in time was 2014. I was a student at Oregon State University. And my recollection is that after Occupy Wall Street, personally, I felt like I was kind of chasing the ghost of Occupy. Like I wanted to get tapped into that movement. I felt like I kind of missed it in ways. I didn't get to fully participate and be present for the Occupy moment when it was happening. But the spirit of Occupy was still very alive and well. When I came to Oregon State University, though, there wasn't any like political left organizations, at least not to my knowledge. We had certain advocacy groups, you know, community groups that were doing good work. But in terms of like student leftism, wasn't really a lot there on the surface. And your book came out right at the same time as I was trying to get plugged into a campus activist environment a milieu that didn't really exist. And what I recall was that your book launching, where we, uh, these folks here, actually Tony and Joseph, were able to bring you to Oregon State University, was a great opportunity to get a gathering of different students, people that didn't know each other at all, into the same room and talking about these ideas. And then I remember I just made an announcement saying like, let's keep talking about these ideas and have a meeting, like an impromptu meeting, and we came together as about five or six people, I believe. Most of them kept sticking it through. And we formed the student group called Allied Students for Another Politics. So very directly inspired by your work and that talk that you gave, which I believe was a double header. I think you had given a talk the night before and then a talk that same day that I was at. And all these folks that didn't know each other at all, had no relationship to each other, found a lot of common ground over these ideas. So that was what was interesting back then. It was like, I was inspired by these ideas. I was inspired by Occupy Wall Street. I was inspired by anarchism and all the ways that you kind of stitch things together, you know, like anarchism and black feminism and horizontalism, prefigurative politics. That made sense to me and that's what I wanted to do. But it turned out all these randos that I didn't know also had the same you know, motivations and the same things that were bringing them to the movement. And we created this group. But, you know, that was back in 2014. And I kind of wonder what you think about the trends today on the left, because if it was 2021 and I was back at Oregon State University, I don't know that people would have just been inspired by these ideas kind of laying around. Like, I don't know that these are very live and ripe ideas today, animating leftist politics, or that the entry point for people just starting to get involved in leftist politics is necessarily similar to what it was then. Like it seems today that there's a reemergence of Leninism, of uh, left electoral strategies. Those things have been basically discredited back in 2014, at least my memory, at least in my mind it was. And now it just seems like the trajectory is very different. So what, what do you think? Is, am I way off on this? Or what do you think about the trends today? Yeah, that's, I think that's really an excellent question. It's one that I've really been, of course, thinking a lot about um, over the last seven years. And in some sense, I was already thinking about in 2014, because I felt like things were even shifting at that point, you know. Um, but first of all, Alex, I just want to say that I still vividly remember um, that time being on the Oregon State campus and being able to present some of those ideas and then actually hang out with you a bit afterwards. Uh, or maybe it was beforehand and talk through some of those things. And I, I actually, that was like one of my fondest experiences of all the, the different kinds of uh, touring that I did in, in relation to that book. Um, and, and maybe in, in connected to that, what I would add is just that in some ways, I actually learned more touring with that book than I did traveling and interviewing people to write that book. Because like traveling and interviewing people to write that book, I just went to like six different major cities in the U.S. and Canadian context, you know, would talk with like maybe up to a dozen people in each of those places, experienced organizers. But when I went on the book tours, I did like four major tour legs across the continent over the course of 15 months. And I was in like 
I think something like 36, 35 or 36 cities. I did something like 70 events. So I met hundreds and hundreds of people. Um, and that's why I say that even in 2014, 2015, I was starting to think about kind of like, how do we make sense of the kind of leftist politics that are circulating right now and the ways that people are coming in um, to these various forms of radical politics. And I think you're right. Like, I think we are in a different moment now. Um, and if we just kind of looked at the surface of it, I think we could say very easily that the kind of core forms of left politics that are offering a lot of uh, reference points and vocabulary for people in North America right now um, would be abolitionist politics, right? Like people who are mobilizing not just against the, the prison industrial complex at this point, but really in significant ways against policing. Um, and against uh, especially the racist character of the carceral state. Um, and then I think we would have to acknowledge as well that democratic socialist politics have really taken off um, in the last five years, I think we would say in particular, right? Um, and there's lots of other stuff too. I mean, I think there's a kind of resurgent feminist politics that's been happening that's related to, but not the same as the Me Too movement, right? Like I think there's a lot of very, very deep kind of uh, queer, radical feminist thinking um, that's in some ways connected to those other politics that I named. Um, and there's other stuff too, right? Like uh, I think there's also been a major surge in people getting engaged in thinking about indigenous struggles particularly in relation to climate justice organizing. Um, and I think that that has opened up kind of new vistas for radical politics, because actually a lot of left political projects um, have to like reckon with some deep stuff when we begin talking about settler colonialism and indigenous struggles. Um, so that's all to say that I think we're in a different moment than we were in 2014 when, when I published this book. And I think that even at the time I understood that another politics as a project was trying to do something impossible, which was capture uh, dynamic movements that were in motion. Um, and so I think what the book offers in some ways is a glimpse at some of the convergence that was happening, particularly through the first decade of the 21st century, partway into I think the second decade of it. Um, and I, you know, as you, as you noted, I was especially interested in this kind of convergence between the work of black feminists, other racialized feminists, um, the longstanding radical thinking there. I was interested in thinking about the long lineage of uh, abolitionist politics at that point, largely focused on the prison industrial complex. Um, which is significantly rooted in the black freedom struggle. Um, and I really wanted to recover this lineage of anarchism, right? I, feel, I felt like there were some real affinities that were becoming clearer among those kinds of strands um, during that period. And it would have been difficult to predict. I don't know if anyone could have predicted exactly how those would go. Um, but at this point, I think we can see that abolitionism has taken off in significant ways. And I think I see that, I see those politics, particularly with the incredible upsurge of the movement for black lives over the last, well, I mean, we can talk about since 2014, 2015, but really I would say in the last two years, especially, right? Like the massive explosion last summer, um, I think indicates that there's something real that's going on there that I think is like taking those, uh, those visions um, and those strategies in pretty exciting directions that I think are still actually um, significantly based in a kind of um, anti-state, anti-capitalist, uh, anti-oppression framework um, that, that is definitely one that I'm committed to, um, but I think are also just opening up like whole new, whole new vistas of opportunity. Now, if we take say democratic socialist politics, Part of the way I've been thinking about that, and Alex, you mentioned that, you know, people being much more interested again in Leninism and in various kinds of elect, left electoral campaigns. Um, part of the way I've been thinking about democratic socialist politics in particular 
is that at, in looking at the history of the left in North America, or even just looking specifically at US uh, movement history, we can see that during different periods, there are ascendant radical politics that, that people gravitate into and that actually frame the kinds of reference points and vocabularies that people take up and use. So, you know, we can think, for instance, about the liberation movements associated with the 1960s, which, of course, the 1960s is not discrete. When I say the 1960s, I'm really talking about the 50s up through the 70s. But in any case, we can say that there was an ascendant kind of politics in that period that was so framed by anti-colonial struggles throughout the world yep. that were throwing off the chains of these European colonial projects and the Black freedom struggle in the United States, especially, right? Emanating from the South, but eventually really across the US context and really the world, right? And there was a kind of anti-imperialism there, an anti-imperialist, anti-capitalist politics that was ascendant during that period. Um, now, that's not to say that there weren't dissenting um, tendencies on the left during that time, but that really was the kind of main thing going on. What's interesting though, when we think about any ascendant politics in any period, you know, looking at the 60s or looking at even democratic socialist politics right now, is that people map out all kinds of different positions within that ascendant politics, right? Um, we could even say this looking at anarchism in the 1990s or the early 2000s, that there are actually a variety of political positions that people are taking, a, a variety of kinds of strategic priorities that people are setting, a variety of assumptions that people have about how social change is gonna happen, some of which are diametrically opposed to each other that are happening within a particular ascendant politics. I think that's happening right now within democratic socialist politics. So I think you can have people who are uh, re trying to recover Leninist politics. And I think even more, I'm even more concerned about the people who seem to be somewhat nostalgic for a particular kind of Stalinist politics. Um, and then you can have people who are actually trying to recover much more a kind of left electoral orientation that's largely about working within the left wing of the Democratic Party. Um, you can find people who take really um, disappointingly class reductionist orientations who, who seem to have kind of just decided to completely ignore all of the amazing innovations that have happened <laughs> in the last number of decades that, that have really, I think, helped us think about class as made through race, as always intertwined with gender and sexuality and ability. Um, so you can also find people who I think in maybe the early 2000s would have identified themselves as anarchists or anti-authoritarians who now understand themselves as democratic socialists, um, but actually carry some of the same priorities, the same commitments to, to a kind of um, non-hierarchical organizing practice, right? Who carry the same skepticism of party building politics, who carry some worries about things like Leninism or vanguardism of various kinds. So I try to relate to it in this way that's like um, things shift in how we think and how we identify ourselves politically and what the sort of ascendant um, left politics is in a, in a period. Um, but also I try to think about some of the themes that carry through. I mean, obviously things change, but then there are some things that I think are consistent um, in how we have these discussions and these debates. Um, and I'm really interested in seeing kind of what develops. I mean, the last thing I'll just say about this is the big difference between when I was writing this book and the current moment is that the left is much, much larger in North America. There are just so many more people who are engaged, um, even if it's just engaged sympathetically with the left, right? Not in a super active way, but there are so many more people who are gravitating into these ideas, trying to figure things out um, and trying to figure out ways to work with other people. And so it's really no longer possible to talk about the left as a marginal political force uh, in the North American context, right? It's a, it's a real vital thing. Um, and part of what that entails is that there's more people doing more things with more ideas about what they're doing. Um, and there's more debate, there's more conflict, there's more tension, but there's also 
so new capacities for creativity and innovation happening too. That seems like a, a, a good segue into the question I have, which is you've, you've talked about ecology as uh, a good model for understanding social movements. And I agree. Um, you've named different perspectives and the ways that they change and merge and come together and break apart and, and new things spring up. Sounds ecological to me, right? Um, one of the things about the abolition movement is that there are people working on those specific issues of policing and the abolition of the prison industrial complex, but also working to set the ground for um, getting rid of any kind of need for those things. So you see mutual aid projects, like especially now during the pandemic, just everywhere, right? So I was wondering if you could talk about this, I guess you would call it a metaphor or model of understanding social movements. That's an ecological one. Yeah. Yeah, and Tony, I mean, I think in some ways that um, I, I am uh, excited about that metaphor, partly because of conversations that like you and I had, you know, like a couple decades ago, right? Like. Um, th I think this comes out of like long-term uh, interests um, that, and I, and I think just like a way of thinking about movements that just makes sense to me. Um, uh, and I was trying to think about at various points, I've tried to figure out like, what is the origin of people talking about movement ecosystems, right? Like that, that term move, uh, movement ecosystem or movement ecosystems. And I, I've been unable to, to find the like precise place where that comes into being. Like I see a lot of different references. I think I, think I first started hearing about that through conversations in the early 2000s. And I think maybe one of the first organizations that I saw using that kind of terminology was the group Movement Generation um, in the San Francisco Bay Area that was really trying to think about a kind of um, radical ecological politics that was also intersectional. Um, and I think they were trying to think also in terms of a strategic orientation that could be capacious enough to actually hold together, together a variety of initiatives and kind of organizing orientations in a way that I think is necessary um, for actually making fundamental change. More recently, I've actually been influenced uh, in thinking about uh, a kind of movement ecology approach um, by um, Jin, Jin Gabi, who wrote this book, um, More Powerful Together, where just this just was published a couple years ago, where she went and interviewed indigenous land defenders and water protectors uh, and various uh, climate justice activists across the Canadian context to talk about strategy. Um, and she identified a whole bunch of important themes out of those conversations. And one of the really consistent things that she found coming up in those conversations was people talking about building a movement ecosystem. Um, and, and I think she does a great job of trying to like elaborate that a little bit. Um, and the way, the way that what I take from her, basically from, from her discussion based on these other conversations is that um, there's not going to be like one magic bullet that's right. going, that's going to make for a fundamental social transformation. Right. Um, and in fact, um, we're strongest on the left when we have a whole bunch of different stuff going on um, and lots of different ways that people are trying to do things. And to the, you know, to the extent that we're able to, to the best of our abilities, we try to do those things in ways that don't, create obstacles for our comrades, right? So like we try to do things that kind of move in the same general direction, don't try to trip each other up, um, but we're also, we're gonna have to kind of come to the realization that we're not gonna fully agree on everything either, right? So there might be some kinds of periods where we can come into alliance or alignment is a word that I think a lot of people are using now around particular strategies or around particular campaigns or actions, but it's, it's less of this perspective that we all need to fall in line behind one thing. Um, and I, I think the other way that um, I've come to think about this was um, 
some work that, that my comrade James Rowe did in the wake of Occupy Wall Street and Occupy movement more generally, where he was talking and looking very carefully at the ways that um, there could be people who are pursuing more like insider strategies, right? Like trying to work within ruling institutions to change them in some way. And there are people who are, who are working on the outside who are basically are trying to overturn ruling institutions. And the ways that often those two camps of people, which we sometimes call reformists and revolutionaries, um, just like really go at it, completely hate on each other all the time, constantly accuse the other side of like doing completely worthless activity. And yet there's a dynamic there, right? There's a dynamism there that when we look historically in any period, we can actually see that they both are doing important work and they're actually kind of reliant on each other. Like the people on the inside can't actually get ruling institutions to shift. I mean, we can see this, for example, with the long history of the black freedom struggle in this country, right? If we look at like the Southern civil rights movement, like there's absolutely no way that any of those victories at the federal level would have been possible without people taking direct action and really pushing the envelope, right? And fully pursuing an outsider strategy. Um, and at the same time, I think we can see that there are ways that um, that the staying on the outside um, means that we don't want to get our hands dirty with any of the policy work or like trying to in consolidate any types of gains. Um, and uh, if, there, if there are allies on the inside doing some of that work, then it means that we can actually consolidate some things along the way. So there's there is this kind of um, I think important relationship there. And I think a movement ecosystem perspective is a, is a little bit of a, a better way to get at some of that dynamic. Um, and I still think though, that there's the difficulty of there are, we do have substantial differences on the left, right? Like there are real arguments to be had about politics and about strategy. Um, and so my only, I would say real hesitation about taking that metaphor up is that I don't want to do away with us being upfront about some of those differences and, and doing work together in principled ways to try and hash some of those out, you know, and, and learn from them. I don't, I don't think it's a successful strategy to just say everything goes, anything's great. You know, if you feel like it's powerful, just do it. Um, we, we do need to develop some ways of thinking together collectively about what we're doing and trying to move in a concerted direction together. Um, but I think we can do that also in ways that don't require us to all always agree on everything and certainly don't require us all to be doing the same thing or be all in the same organization or something like that. I wanted to follow up on something about that, Chris. So, I mean, as you sort of laid it out, right, the, the movement ecology metaphor is helpful as a kind of tool of analysis to sort of see like what's going on and to sort of notice that different people are approaching different kinds of ways, like electoral strategies, direct action strategies, prefigurative strategies, right? The anglers talk about this too, right? As movements right. having all these different kinds of bubbling up points. Um, I wonder whether, you know, based on some of the reading, uh, the, the writing that you've done recently has to do with the dangers of kind of sectarianism amongst the left and like trying to figure out like how to mitigate that. I wonder whether like the movement ecology metaphor that you're talking about gives us any tips or tools about how to avoid like the really uh, insidious kinds of internal conflicts amongst the left that pop up every once in a while. Like, you know, like Alex was mentioning, right, there's certain kinds of trends going on right now. And back in 2014, there was the Occupy movement, which in, in a sense was a movement in the sense that it had different wings and different branches of people, but was somewhat unified. And, you know, as what you've talked about now, there's lots of different things happening right now, but it's not clear that, I mean, at least to me, that there's a movement going on. There's labor struggles going on. There's abolition stuff going on. There's indigenous struggles. And these are all very vibrant, but it's not clear that it's in the context of a, of a movement. Hmm. Uh, I, so I may be wrong about that. Hmm. But then the question is, like, there does seem to be conflict because I do see, you know, at least... In social media, like, you know, the Leninist 
tearing apart this and that and DSA being criticized for this and that. And so I know that you've been thinking a lot about sectarianism. So I'm just wondering, like, you know, are there are there ways in which we can think about how to coordinate and to work together in the absence of a, an umbrella kind of movement structure? Yeah, I mean, it's an excellent question. And and I mean, to get to get to your smaller point, just about like, is there a movement right now? I mean, I feel like that's a question that people have been actually asking since about 1969. Um, <laughs> and, you know, like, and I, and I don't know that we can, we can come up with like a clear answer, right? Like, I think that definitely there are movements happening at any given time. And some of them are more emergent. Some of them are um, less so, right? Some of them are, are, are really ebbing. Um, uh, and I think the, the question is to what extent are um, radical politics uh, like gaining ground? To what extent are they starting to expand and bring in new people in various ways? Um, and to what extent are people learning and building on what they've been doing rather than just kind of doing the same stuff over and over again? And to what extent are people having some kind of cross-sectoral collaborations? Mm -hmm. um, because that's the other thing I think, um, I think I particularly picked this up from people who have um, thought really critically about the role of nonprofit organizations in the US left, you know, Insight, Women of Color Against Violence really did phenomenal work in thinking about the limits of what they call the nonprofit industrial complex. And those kinds of folks have often talked about the tendency towards siloing like silos of practice um, yeah. in the US left. And so I'm always looking for like, how are people trying to bust out of the silos? And that's not just limited to thinking about nonprofits either. We can think about that in terms of the labor movement and unions. We can think about that in terms of student activist politics of various sorts. And we can certainly talk about that in relation to environmental activism of various kinds, right? Um, but to, to get to your bigger question, about sectarianism, I think it's a crucial question. Um, and it's one that I've really wrestled with as someone who, you know, I really do identify myself as connected to a political tradition that is the anarchist political tradition, um, which has a long um, and not sometimes not so great history of engaging in a lot of sectarian practice um, in relation to other left political tendencies. I mean, I think other left political tendencies also have some of their own <laughs> terrible histories on this count too. Um, and so recently, part of how I've been thinking about sectarianism, and actually, you know, to be totally honest, this is something that I began really reckoning with when I was uh, touring with another politics, because people would come out for events and we'd be, I'd be doing a workshop of some kind, talking about strategy, you know, whatever the case might be. And there would sometimes be usually a guy, usually an older white guy in the discussion afterward who would say, but don't you think that the main thing we need to be doing right now is building a party? You know, don't you think we should be building the party? Um, and, and I realized at a certain point in after this having happened many, many times over that um, I didn't actually have a big stake in whether people are going to try and build a party. Um, and I didn't need to fight with people about this, you know, like I, so I started saying in a very genuine way in those kinds of discussions, if you want to build a radical party, go for it, like more power to you. Like I want to encourage people to like run with their ideas and try and build the things that they, that they feel like are gonna be effective vehicles for making uh, social transformation right now. And I think, so part of how I think about sectarianism is like bring a little bit of a spirit of like openness in understanding that probably we don't have everything figured out. I mean, I think it's pretty likely that we don't because if we had, we probably would have won by now, right? Like we would have made a, a revolution. Um, and so I think part of it is encouraging people to just do things um, and say, because I do, I basically I always think it's better for people to try and build things than it is for us to spend our time largely um, critiquing other people's efforts 
um, in which we have very little involvement. Um, and, I, and I think that's kind of the, one of the primary forms that sectarianism takes right now, particularly propelled through certain kinds of social media cultures is people commenting on the work of other people that they don't actually have much of a tangible connection to um, and saying, this isn't gonna work and this is why, or this is really messed up and this is why. Um, I, I'm more like, I wanna see what you can do, right? And like, can you bring more people into that? Can you make that happen? Like, what can we learn from your experience doing that? Now, at the same time, I do think it's important to clarify that there are, certain kinds of organizing or certain kinds of organizations that do require us to be critical, right? Like the, the left has a long history of having incredibly dysfunctional organizations and initiatives at various points that really harm people, you know? Whether we're talking about groups that really reproduce uh, racist uh, or sexist, dynamics of various kinds, right? Like reproduce the, some of the worst social hierarchies on our society. Or, you know, we can even think about some of the like kind of cultish forms that yeah. some revolutionary organizations have taken historically. So I do, think, I do think there are times when it's totally warranted to be critical about things that are happening. But even in those instances, I think it's more effective when it's people who are directly involved addressing some of those problems rather than people kind of on the sidelines um, just trying to knock them down. Um, so, so that's all just to say that I am really interested in a, what does it mean to be non-sectarian in this period, to be principled about where we stand, but also try to take an approach that's about encouraging people to build and maintaining some dialogue around that. And on, on that front, I would say that part of what has been heartening to me is to see more people thinking about um, what, what they sometimes call multi-tendency organizing efforts. Um, this, this is something that first came to my attention with an initiative in Halifax in Nova Scotia in Canada, where there was a, a long-standing group that um, started, well, they started and they stuck around for a good long time called Solidarity Halifax. And they explicitly defined themselves as a multi-tendency anti-capitalist organization. And so what that meant for them was that they had a basis of unity around trying to fight capitalism and a basis of unity around the kind of particular orientation they took toward fighting oppression. And they said, but we also have a whole bunch of areas where we don't agree on everything. And they had an active practice of regularly getting into discussions around these areas that we might understand as kind of points of political tension. Um, so there were people involved in this who were longtime socialists, there were people who would probably consider themselves anarchists of various kinds. There are sort of independent leftists of various sorts. I'm interested in um, what kinds of things we can do together when we take a more non-sectarian multi-tenancy approach. I think that we can maybe get away from some of these, um, some of these ruts where people are just kind of like throwing shade at each other all the time. I really like what you say about non-sectarian building, you know, and enc encouraging and inspiring people to try to materialize their ideas, to run with their ideas, but particularly noting that if it comes from folks directly involved, directly participating in the project, that it's more beneficial because you also write a lot about intergenerational movements and movement mentorship, as I like to think of it. I feel like this really is aligned because what I find often is lacking in movement spaces is those mentors that can provide the clarity of their experience, can help guide folks towards, you know, trying to realize their ideas, trying to bring, bring about change and steering them away from common mistakes, but also not just tamping it down. So I, I really appreciate that. And I just find that it's really lacking. And even when it exists, I find that often it looks more like kind of the sectarian tendency that you're talking about with people just be like, that's not gonna work. You know, I can't tell you how many times, uh, particularly in labor circles, there's all these old veteran labor folks, they're all great. And they're like, yeah, we tried that, we did that, that happened last year, it doesn't work, doesn't work. It's all just discouragement. So I just wonder if you could talk a little bit more about how we could start cultivating an intergenerational movement politics and be good mentors to folks that 
are coming behind us or are new to leftist politics. Yeah, th- I mean, this is this is something that's really, I think, been on my mind um, for most of my political life, which is to say all my adult life. And uh, part of the reason for that was that I really, I, I didn't realize this at the time, but I was uniquely, um, like I was in a unique situation in that I had access to radical mentors starting when I was 13. Um, You know, like I was at a public alternative school in Anchorage, Alaska that happened to have some radical teachers on staff um, that I got to know. And they introduced me. They were people who at that point were in their uh, like 30s, 40s. Um, They introduced me to people who were at that point in their 70s. Um, You know, so like one one of my longest running anarchist mentors, Ruth Sheridan, who just died a couple of years ago, um, just before she turned 100. Um, you know, she she was a way that I was connected to an anarchist tradition that was not from even the new left, was not from the 1960s, right? I was through her connected to an anarchist tradition that came from the 20s and 30s, um, like came from the early 20th century. And and like I said, that's it wasn't until much later in my life that I realized that those kinds of intergenerational connections that I benefited from were very, very rare. Um, I think particularly for white people um, in the North American left. I, th- I think that there are some more, um, more, some of the more racialized sectors of the North American left. Um, I've seen this in people who are part of the black radical tradition. I've seen this in certain kinds of indigenous organizing. There's other examples too of uh, people who do sustain some of those kinds of intergenerational chains of struggle, those intergenerational connections where people really carry memories and have ways of passing them on to new generations of people. Um, But it's something that I feel really keen about trying to cultivate more of, um, of that kind of um, intergenerational connection. And I mean, I do think, first of all, that the the dynamic that you named, Alex, of of older people really kind of slapping down um, younger people's ideas, um, or and we we can also um, think of this not just in terms of age, right? We can think of this in terms of political experience. So, like people with more political experience slapping down the ideas of people with less political experience. Um, that's like a really straightforward lesson right there. Like that's a terrible thing to do. And I understand the um, the impetus for that. Like I'm old enough now, you know, I'm in my mid forties now and I've been in enough meetings now with less experienced people where they're kicking around ideas that are things that I tried out at some point and didn't work for me that I, I understand that impulse to sort of bring in that experience and use it as, as a sort of, um, uh, like a demolition tool, <laughs> you know? Um, but that is actually what it is. is it's just, it just kind of like destroys possibility. And, and the thing is, I, I've also been around long enough to discover that stuff that didn't work for me uh, when I was in my teens or my twenties, people have managed to pull it off now, you know, like circumstances change. Like we're in a dynamic social situation where stuff that we may have tried at some point that didn't work could actually work super well now. Um, so like, what, what exactly do we know? I, so I think there is something there in terms of a mentorship practice that's about, again, um, trying to remain open to, to new possibilities and also understanding inter- intergenerational relationship building on the left as always a two-way process. Right, it's not about trying to uh, for older or more experienced people to just kind of have this transmission belt of their experience and knowledge to younger, less experienced people. Like often, when I'm engaging with people who are younger, I feel like I'm learning even more um, than than I have to really offer. Like I sometimes feel like I'm uh, taking advantage of people because I'm 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 getting like more out of it in some way, you know. And and I think that's that's probably a good way to think about it. Um, and then the other thing too is, I'm sure you've all, you know, it, it, through various organizing trainings, you know, heard about there's there's the ratios when you're doing like one on ones, when you're doing like knocking on doors about how much you should be talking versus how much the person you're interacting with within the labor movement. People think about this 
in, in terms of certain organizing models, but it's also part of a certain community organizing tradition, right? So people talk about like 70%, 30% or 80%, 20%. Basically the idea that I like there is that when we're interacting with people, we're asking questions. Like most of what we're doing is trying to uh, ask people to clarify their own ideas, their own understandings and their own experiences. And, to, and then to some extent, we're trying to offer, you know, whatever kinds of insights we might have too. But I think that goes well for thinking about intergenerational movement building too, right? Is, is like engaging with people in a genuine way that's about asking about their experiences um, rather than trying to just like tell them what, you know, what to do. Um, and uh, I mean, I mean, there's 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 so much more to say about the the intergenerational stuff. I mean, I at the same time as we're talking about all of that, which is kind of framed, I, th I feel like the conversation we've been having so far about intergenerational uh, relationships and mentoring, it's very individualized, right? It's very like um, I'm a single activist or organizer, and I'm trying to build a relationship with another individual uh, activist or organizer who's going to help me. And I think those relationships are really crucial. Um, and I, I, part of why I want people to stick around and struggle, stick around in movements is to help foster more of those. So there's like numerically more people around who can be helping with that. Um, I think there's another dimension though, to intergenerational movement building. And that's thinking about what kinds of like institutions, what kinds of cultural practices can we develop together that are collective, that are about helping people stick around building those relationships, not just in a one-on-one -on -one way, but in like collectivities. Um, and, and lately, um, part of how I've been looking at that is thinking about all the different periods in US movement history that people have built institutions around children, right? Mm -hmm. Like left organizations who put tons of resources and energy. And usually of course, the people spearheading these efforts have been women um, to, create um, opportunities for kids to be learning things together and coming to develop their own capacities within left projects, right? I mean, and there's, there's just tons of examples. I mean, like the Wobblies had a whole junior Wobblies program that still do. did, still do, that's right, yeah. I mean, in fact, I've, I've been in touch with some of them who were kind of rebooted a, a summer camp uh, in the last several years. Um, there were socialists at the very turn of the 20th century who were running socialist Sunday schools, right? Um, you know, the communist party had its alternative to the Boy Scouts, the Young Pioneers. Um, various organizations were building summer camps for children, but also actually for families to go participate in together. So, I mean, there's tons, there's just tons of examples. We can think about all these lineages within the black freedom movement of people creating spaces to care for children and carry intergenerational memory in the face of massive anti-Black racism, right? Um, so, or we can even think about it in terms of the women's liberation movement and the gay liberation movement and all of the amazing experiments that were happening in the late 60s and 1970s of people thinking about how do we care for kids in radical collective ways that can help carry these politics and build on them. Um, so I do think, there's something there too about how we create the infrastructure for multiple generations to be together within movements. And unfortunately, I think a lot of what's happened in the last few decades is that um, movements have been very uh, generationally segregated. I mean, and I think that there's probably some roots to this in the new left in the 1960s um, and in conceptualizing uh, the 1960s as a kind of youth rebellion or youth revolt, right? Um, uh, so I think there's something to recover there uh, from some of these previous efforts that were actually interested in bringing generations together, um, where people could really learn together and thrive as they moved through all the various life stages that, that we go through to some extent. That's beautiful. Um, can I just mention for people who are watching this that I can think of three examples right off the top of my head of uh, institutional kinds of organizing. Uh, 
that are going on or projects that are going on that built in intergenerational relationships from the very beginning and thought about it really. And one of course is Highlander Center. Um, so if you don't know about Highlander Center, please check it out. You already mentioned the other one, Movement Generation. They're doing great work. <clears throat> and the third one is the Asekia Institute in Southern Colorado that is trying to uh, build a solidarity economy mm -hmm. and, and uh, actually change the whole social way that people create their lives together in a locality, in a place, it's land-based, San Luis in Colorado. Mm -hmm. So a Seiki Institute has been thinking about how to do this intergenerationally from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. So just think people wanna check these things out. I would add to another example that was was really inspiring to me. It's it's they're not doing doing it anymore right now. But for a number of years, no one knows illegal Vancouver a radical migrant justice collective and Vancouver, uh, British Columbia was running um, a project they called Inheriting Resistance, which is they basically would go they identified um, older like long term radicals in their community. Um, most of whom are not famous, you know, like not people that you would hear about. Um, and they would go do these uh, in-depth interviews with them that they would film. And then they started putting up a series of these interviews mm -hmm. with these movement elders. Mm -hmm. um, and it was really gorgeous. And they did some community events as well where they like shared some of these videos too. And it was really an attempt to kind of generalize some of those intergenerational movement relationships within a particular community. Something that strikes me about the way that you're talking about this, Chris, is, um, uh, you know, speaking about metaphors and everything, uh, 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 space-time, time-space. Um, on the one hand, when you talk about movement ecology, there's a kind of, um, spatial dimension to this, which you talked about before, about sort of contemporary organizations trying to find ways to work with one another and not get in each other's way, but be supportive. You talked about that in some sense, but it strikes me that part of what you're also talking about is movement ecology temporally, time-wise, thinking about ways in which we can have learning from multiple different movements at different times, and how do we pass on wisdom about strategy and tactics and what works and what doesn't work over time to one another uh, so that uh, movement ecology is both sort of like this kind of spatial thing about how do we work with our contemporaries but also how do we sort of connect temporally with you know other generations yeah. uh, and that's uh, um, that's those are all complicated tasks but it seems to me that like a really healthy sort of way of thinking about movements is the need for maintaining those kinds of ecological ties spatially and temporally I think that's right. Yeah, I hadn't I hadn't actually thought about it that in that way, but I think I think that's a really useful way to conceptualize it, both in terms of time and space and in maintaining those connections and and in terms of the time part. Um, one of the ways I've recently been thinking about it is um, there's this uh, radical sociologist Alan Sears, who comes out of socialist and queer liberation politics. And he wrote a book, um, actually that was published the same year as mine called The Next New Left, where he really explores his, this concept he has called infrastructure of dissent. And basically his argument, um, mm -hmm. I mean, Alan's a wonderful person, just as an activist, he's a totally dedicated person, but I particularly appreciate this concept of infrastructure of dissent because he's looking at movements historically and saying, what was some of the kind of gel it held these things together. Um, and he looks at some of the radical labor organizing from the 1930s, but then he also looks at um, some of the like anti-war and um, liberation politics of the 1960s. And he says, in these instances, there, were inf there was actual like sort of infrastructure that helped people to come together and learn from one another. Um, and sometimes that infrastructure is actually physical places. Like, so for example, he looks at like working class cities in the thirties and he's like, look, there would be these streets that lots of people would live on. And there would be like pubs where people would hang out after work. Um, and they would like talk together, right? And they'd often be 
on a factory line in work teams, and then they would go and socialize together. Um, and there would be community centers, cultural centers where people were participating in activities with their children. They had this actual infrastructure where they were coming together, and exchanging ideas, and there, where there was some of this passing on of stories, right? From, pre, from previous experiences of struggle. It was actually a concrete way that some of that kind of uh, temporal dimension could be sustained was through this infrastructure of dissent um, and like kind of holding different generations together. Uh, I mean, in looking at the 1960s, he's much more interested in thinking about the role of universities and the kinds of spaces that radical students were able to create, but also the thriving underground print culture mm. of the 60s and 70s, right? Like all the amazing publications that people built that circulated all over the continent and helped people to share ideas and experiences and analyses. Um, and his question, which I think is an important one, is he says, what do we need to do today to build the infrastructure of dissent that is appropriate to the circumstances that we're currently living in? And I think that's a real challenge, right? Because if we think about our circumstances today, people are more atomized than perhaps at any other moment in the last at least 100 years, perhaps longer. I mean, here I'm speaking specifically about North America. People are, I think, more stressed, more debt ridden, more um, like hustling to, to work multiple jobs and care for the various people in their lives, right? Like people are under a lot of strain and stress and actually have very few access or very few points of access to collectivity, to community. And there's not a lot of pre-existing infrastructure to hold people together, bring people together, provide conduits for people to share these stories and reflections and do some of this building together. So, and I don't, I don't feel I actually have an adequate answer to this question, but it's one that I'm really thinking a lot about and I'm eager to explore some of the ways that people are, I think, trying to, to respond to that, right? Um, and go about kind of re-knitting or maybe reinventing uh, collectivities for our own time that can do some of that temporal sharing and transmission that I, that I think we just really need. I like the dynamic way we're talking about this. And I think we have to be careful about our language because we say things like, passing on transmission mm. all that but mm. but chris you've already said this but it's really about talking together mm -hmm. making the road by walking like the zapatistas say yeah. so it's about asking questions because you might you might learn about a story you didn't know and and get a lot from that but you have questions about it so mm. so then you ask the person who's telling the story but what about this and they may not have ever thought about that before That's right, right? And so things get to evolve and it becomes this process of conversation, making the road while we're walking. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Thank you, Tony, for that. Yeah, that's really helpful. Yeah, I, you're right. I, I slipped into talking about that more like unidirectional way of, of sharing. But it's really true that, yeah, that's that goes back to what Alex was saying earlier about that, that kind of mode where it's just about like, no, I've got, you know, I know what the right way is and this is the right way. But yeah, you're right. It's it's totally about the kind of collaborative reflection and discussion. And and I and actually so much of what we know about how remembering happens, right? Mm -hmm. Is that it's not an individual phenomenon. Remembering is always relational. It's something that we construct together collectively through telling stories, through sharing with people, through hearing their responses, and the, and other people being like, well, that's not exactly how I understood it. That's not exactly how I remembered it. Like there, there's something that's so much more dynamic there. And that's actually one of the reasons why um, text is wonderful, but insufficient mm. for, for doing some of this kind of intergenerational connecting, right? Like it's, that is a lot of what we have access to right now is reading words, um, but they're so much more static um, than the kind of dynamic um, relational ways that we can interact um, when we're talking together. Plus, too, something, I mean, a, the, an experience that I think Tony and I have had, uh, we did a, uh, before the COVID lockdowns, we had a film series at OSU uh, in which we sort of examined the, say, last 
I guess 40 years or so of social movement history uh, through various kinds of short documentaries. And we sort of went back to um, the late 1960s, looking at the anti-war movement there, but particularly looking through it through the standpoint of the Chicano liberation, mm -hmm. anti-war stuff. Then we sort of talked a little bit about uh, anti-war stuff during the 1970s, anti-nuclear stuff. Then it was uh, global justice. And then we ended up talking about Occupy. And, you know, when this was over a series of several weeks and, you know, people were, you know, kept saying as they were, as we were watching, this is something that they noticed the, the commonality in all of these moments was when these, when these movements started to be able to bring people together to have a certain kind of realization of the inner, you know, the interconnections between capital state and the carceral system or the military industrial complex, when those kinds of things started to become focus points for the movement, that's when state crackdowns would happen almost inevitably in the last 40 or so years. And so it was, you know, I, I started to see this too. It's something I hadn't picked up is that, you know, the inevitable story of so many of these movements is, and then the police cracked down and, you know, everyone went to jail or got burnt out or died. And that was the end of it all, right? And so it was just like, wow, you know, so seeing those kinds of histories too is helpful for generating capacity, like we've been talking about. But it's also helpful in terms of just being able to see analysis so that we see like, you know, uh, you know, moments in time, you know, in like the last five to 10 years are important to recognize, but then you start to see bigger connections when you have that kind of intergenerational uh, perspective going on. Yeah, that's really true. Yeah, yeah and I remember, I mean, state repression is its own particular topic that really does, I think, um, for rec in terms of reckoning with state repression on the left, that's something where intergenerational connections are so vital, right? Like in one of the places I saw that play out was in the context of the so-called green scare, right? Against people who are engaged in uh, animal, the animal liberation front and the earth liberation front in uh, the early 2000s who had uh, gone about uh, a whole series of uh, actions with, with property destruction. I mean, they never hurt any, any people, but they did definitely destroy some facilities that they saw as uh, ecologically destructive and uh, killing animals. And that was especially happening in the Pacific Northwest. And in, during the Green Scare, that's basically when the FBI targeted whole bunch of those right. folks and managed to get somebody to flip and then started um, uh, going after them legally and arresting them. Um, and a lot of those people at that point were in their late twenties, um, didn't have a lot of connection to previous generations that had gone through those experiences of being targeted by the state. And this didn't happen across the board. In fact, there were a lot of people who unfortunately really turned on each other in, in that moment. But there were some people uh, in that milieu who were able to build connections with folks who had been targeted uh, as part of their activities in liberation movements of the 60s and 70s, um, many, many of whom had spent time underground um, and most of whom had spent time in prison. And I saw these wonderful connections that some of those people were able to build intergenerationally around sharing experiences of withstanding state repression. Um, withstanding grand juries, you know, withstanding the threats of prison time, and then actually preparing as well to go into prison um, and think about how they were going to handle that um, with these experienced people who had done that, that very thing based on their own previous political commitments. Um, so there were, there were some really wonderful connections there. Um, and I continue to really feel like that's a kind of underdeveloped mm. area. Mm. Um, because you're right, right? Like when we look at these moments when movements are actually beginning to gain steam, it's when they're building those connections and then inevitably they're attacked by the state in one form or another. Um, and we can really learn a lot from the people who have been through previous circumstances, faced those attacks and, you know, really suffered as a result, but also, um, you know, stuck around and really learn from it. And I agree with you too, Chris, that I think some of these things actually have survived. Some of our resiliency and movement spaces uh, still lives on today. And something that I just wanted to share with you all was a recent discovery for myself was, you know, I, I now work for a union based in Philadelphia. 
and our legacy is 100 years old. And 100 years ago, the founders of this union, the folks that formed it, that built it, largely were you know, integral to building the Congress of Industrial Organizations as well. They built cooperative housing, mm-hmm. uh, these kinds of infrastructure of dissent that you're talking about. I really like that expression. I'm definitely going to start using that more often. Um, and they also even created their own bank. So they tried to create financial independence from themselves and the state uh, and the employer. Right? They didn't want to become completely reliant on that. And that bank still exists today. It's called the Amalgamated Bank. Mm-hmm. It's the only union-owned bank in the whole country of the United mm-hmm. States. Wow. So these legacies do exist, but it's like we're always in this process of having to kind of rediscover our own histories of struggle. And it reminds me now, almost you know, serendipitously, of your own chapter in another politics talking about movement amnesia yeah. and the need to continue to like fight against forgetting. So do you, how much do you think that's the role of like our movement elders and our mentors to share the stories and be those, you know, archivists of our own struggles and history and successes? Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, I do think that that's such an important role. I mean, uh, one thing I should say as an aside is that one of the critiques that uh, that I got that I actually really learned from in relation to that chapter was from some disability justice activists who pointed out to me that amnesia is actually a very specific kind of condition. Um, and it's not necessarily a useful framework for thinking about what happens with collective memory. Um, and so uh, in the last few years, I have made an intentional decision to stop talking about it in terms of amnesia and really to go uh, much harder on the expression that I used from um, the, the two radical queer scholars, uh, Patrizia Gentile and uh, Gary Kinsman, who talk about the social organization of forgetting, right? Like they talk about the kind of wholesale decimation of our capacities for understanding these social gains of the past and, uh, and all of what's kind of occurred that's created the present that we live in. And I really, I do feel like that is, I mean, this is connected to some of the stuff I was saying earlier about our present moment, right? And the kind of like level of atomized life that so many of us are living in and all of the kinds of pressures that we're experiencing daily and just like based on our material circumstances. I feel like that is all very much bound up as well with a kind of orientation always toward the present, right? Like as if it's a kind of severed experience from all of what's happened prior to this present. Um, like I, I do think that uh, rekindling connections to the past is so important and being able to like think historically is so crucial. Um, and so certainly people who have lived through the past are a crucial, <laughs> a crucial connection uh, to that. And I do think that um, that's, a, that's an important aspect of intergenerational movement building is doing precisely what you said, Alex, that kind of um, like archival work. I mean, it's not the same as like, you know, formal archives where people, or there's like, we can go to a, a library and request the, the documents or whatever. But, and I mean, I, on that, I would just say too, that like some of the best archives I've ever encountered are actually the ones that are maintained by individual activists and organizers who've just stuck around for decades and collected stuff that they felt in some way was gonna be helpful down the road, you know? So like you just go into their closet or their bookcase or something and you discover all of these documents related to different organizing initiatives or groups or political tendencies, right? Like that's invaluable. That's really invaluable. I mean, the internet does facilitate some wonderful things too. Like I've taken a lot of heart from the turn toward oral history projects in the last decade. I mean, whether we're talking about, um, you know, the ACT UP oral history project, which is primarily centered around New York, um, or we're talking about, oh, there's there's an analog in the Canadian context, the Direct Action AIDS oral history project. Um, There've been various kinds of uh, oral history projects related to the women's liberation movement that people have been putting together over the last years. Um, there's there's more of that, and that's great, you know. Um, but still, it's it's wonderful when when people stick around and they can provide some of that some of that connection concretely too. 
when's the revolution going to happen? <laughs> What's your prediction there, Chris? It's probably not the best way to end the segment. <laughs> I mean, one thing that the um, COVID-19 pandemic hit really hammered home for me was how um, how predicting things doesn't work very well. Like at a certain point in the last year, I kind of gave up on predictions because everything just felt so constantly unpredictable. Um, and at the same time, it's like, I do feel like, I mean, it's so evident in the US context in particular, right? That things are very unstable. Like things are so crisis ridden in so many ways and they can't actually carry on as they are. And the question is, which direction are they going to go in? So it really does feel like um, this is a really kind of risky period that we're in. I mean, particularly when we think about it in terms of the crises that are more global in scope, you know, related to the, you know, the climate emergency, um, uh, the kind of cri the crises of capitalism that I think we're experiencing and of care really on a global scale. Um, but it does all feel kind of like, what's going to happen? Where's it going to go? It's actually going to be on us in many ways, you know, on us and millions of others moving in motion to try and try and move it in a particular direction. And so in that sense, I actually am more hopeful than I've been in maybe 20 years mm -hmm. um, because it's, it, it at least feels like there are a lot of people stepping up and trying to figure that out. Um, even as the stakes are probably higher than they've ever been in my lifetime. Oh, well, that, that's a that's a good place, I think, to sort of wind up, but also one that leaves open a whole host of other sort of questions to sort of engage in and think about. Um, but I want to say thank you, Chris, for spending some time with us to help us unpack some of the themes that have been going on in your writing and that are really, um, I think, uh, motivational to think about the possibilities for moving ahead, as you say. So I think that your work has been always very influential and insightful in thinking about how we can have a hopeful disposition to make transformational change. So thank you for being with us. Oh, it's been such a pleasure to talk with you all. Just And also just to kind of, I mean, my time doing radical activist work in Corvallis was such a crucial period for me. And so I love this opportunity to, to reconnect with some of that time as well through all of you and, and all of the work that you have continued to do uh, within, that, within that context, you know. Thank you. And thanks to Alex, of course. We'll put some links out to your own work and uh, uh, your podcast so that uh, viewers can pay attention to that. But thanks for joining us and sharing your experiences. Yeah, it was my pleasure. I really appreciated hearing your thoughts and your wisdom, Chris. And Tony, thank you for uh, coming on board once again to help me out to uh, do one of these conversations. Always appreciate it when you can show up to help me out and uh, keep uh, uh, everyone in tune. I get so much from it. Thank you all. And thank you all for joining, joining in with us and, and, and talking. Uh, you can find us at the, uh, on the Anaris Project social media everywhere. We're on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Uh, we're at anarisproject.org. And uh, please leave us uh, some comments. Let us know what you think. Uh, help us to understand a little bit about where you think social movements are today. Have you been influenced by the idea of another politics? We'd love to hear from you. So thank you all once again. Thank you, Chris. Thanks, Alex. Thanks, Tony.